strong at strategies to use the lowest, simplest dimensional systems to introduce the concepts. And in one dimension, we snuck in an extra dimension in chapter three by adding a parameter to a system. So dynamical systems came in families uh, parameterized by an, something like, uh, you know, your heating water in your experiment and your parameter is temperature or you are shearing something or you are applying electric field. The parameter uh, led us to bifurcations. There was a generic one where you uh, have nothing or you get a stable, unstable pair. That was called saddle node bifurcation or blue sky bifurcation. And then uh, if you had the reflection symmetry, then you are forced to take a, a different norm. And that was called a pitchfork bifurcation. And that was sort of basically all we got out of one dimension. What's wonderful about these bifurcations is that every, anything you find in one dimension will transfer to two, but not only to two, it will transfer to three, to four, and to a million dimensions. So when we do experiments in fluid dynamics on third floor and we look at onset of turbulence, it starts by uh, this one-dimensional wisdom. So. So that's a very useful set of things to know. And what happens in two dimensions is everything you knew in one gets transferred. So I'll, I'll explain, you know, how, how it looks like when it's two dimensional setting. And then there is a one genuinely new thing, which is very important, which is called hop bifurcation. And that I'll do next week. So we settled out bifurcations. In one dimension, we just had this, you know, we said we had the velocity along the line X had one parameter. If velocity was positive, then when X was small, uh, the velocity was positive, so thing could speed up. And when X was large, which was for large negative, large positive, they would slow down. And you always told to find fixed points of the system or equilibria. So this is very easy. If you write this as square root squared mu, then this is just square root minus x times square root plus x. So there are two zeros. And now we cheat and we make it two dimensional, boom. We just add one dimension to it. That's a very boring dimension. All that's happening in the second dimension is I always have negative velocity, so I'm always going towards zero. So the flow in two dimensions looks like this. When mu is large, then on the if there was no second dimension, uh, if it's positive, then there are these two zeros. And you know, if you can picture it, this is a curve that goes up because when X is zero, it's at its highest point on each side is lower. So it goes up and down. And when you look at this fixed point, on the right-hand side, it has a negative slope, so it says it's shrinking. And on the left root, has a positive slope, so it says it's pushing away. You notice from one dimension bifurcation. So two-dimensional dynamics is you know, very simple. Y is just falling like ton of rocks to the uh, horizontal line, Y equals zero line. And uh, if it's doing it, on this stable manifold of this particular fixed point, what happens because it's repelling in horizontal direction, you have a hyperbolic uh, fixed point. 
So you fall in and you run away, you fall in and run away. But if you're on this side of a stable manifold, just a vertical line in this case, you fall in and you flow every place on this strip to the fixed point and every place on the right-hand side, you flow to the fixed point. So there's a separate fix. On the left-hand side, you run away. On the right-hand side, you fall in. And uh, if mu is zero, then you get into this weird situation that from the left-hand side, it looks repelling, but from the right-hand side, it looks attractive. And uh, again, you still have this separate tricks, this stable manifold. So these guys are running this way. These guys are running right, that way. Uh, but the world is still divided in two halves. Now, if mu is negative, you cannot write this. But you know that polynomials of nth order have nth roots. It's just that some of them can be in complex plane. So the roots are now purely imaginary. And if you live in the real world, you don't see them. They're in extra dimensions, which are not drawn here. So now what happens is that these uh, points are not there. they are not fixed points. And uh, the flow is always that Y is pushing you toward the x-axis. But on x-axis, everybody is negative because mu is negative, this is negative. So just moving to the left. And uh, you know, only thing that you see, there is a ghost in a sense that if mu is small, that means that at some point the velocity along the x will be small because it'll be as small as minus mu. So you'll be you know, zipping along here, slow down and go down. And that is the just the replay of one dimensional bifurcation, but you have added the next dimension by making uh, the X line attractive. One dimensional world is the one that you end up uh, in this extra dimension. Now, you know, bifurcations quickly, at least for me, they get tedious because uh, very quickly you have lots of cases you have to consider. Because of course, I could have taken this to be plus instead of minus. Uh, then uh, computers don't like it because, you know, any place you start off the X line, you just run away. So, you know, that's not an example that you would see if you just blindly run the computer. But it turns out it's still important because then this line, you know, will be separate tricks of the world up and world down. And sometimes this is very important. You know, you'll get into the kind of bistable situation where you have to decide whether, we'll have examples like a, very soon, but you've seen it. Yeah. Is protein going to be created or not? And it has to do on which side of the separate tricks, unstable. Now, in two dimensions, uh, I'll just you know, draw a picture. What happens in two dimensions, you'll have equations which are not just separated like that. They'll be coupled. But if you have a quadratic equation, second order equation, you'll still find two roots. So you'll find two roots someplace in the x, y plane. And uh, whenever you have a sudden load bifurcation, one of them will be stable, one of them will be unstable. So the linear analysis, you'll have to do now two by two matrices, find eigenvectors, eigenvalues. But qualitatively, it'll be the same story. Uh, there'll be some parameter hidden someplace in your equations. And I'll work one example. And um, if the things work out in such a way that you have a, a sink in you know, a fully attractive point, then you'll have topologically same kind of behavior as before. You know, if you're on this side of the world, uh, then you end up into this here. If you're on this side of the world, then you run away. Uh, 
so qualitatively things will look the same and the main thing that you will notice and we see it in experiments uh, again for me fluid dynamics is easiest to visualize uh, you know there will be some critical value of the parameter where this is tangent and for that you know infinite precision co-dimension one value parameter the system will look weird because on one side it'll be attractive on the other side it will be repelling and uh, if the parameter goes a little bit between the critical value then you'll spend lots of time believing you're getting into the situation but when you get it into the neighborhood itself you discover nobody wants you so just zip through but you know it can be very dramatic effect when you look at, uh, at, at your experiment because it will happen in fluids and also in neurosciences that you'll get to this neighborhood, you'll be very slow, so you'll dominate your data hanging around there. And then you'll escape it with some burst and then some other higher order terms in your equations will kick in to control that behavior. So there'll be some you know, complicated behavior and you'll come back. So that's the idea of the Saddle node in higher bifurcations, and you know, we can work out one example, which is Rogat 811. So, as you know, presumably RNA, its purpose in, uh, you know, in our life is to take instructions from DNA and transfer them to a you know, it's a little machine that will uh, produce a protein. So, for example, my undergraduate thesis was measuring, you know, proteins being created. Uh, and uh, it's totally central to life. But <laughs> equation, you know, brought to its essence, uh, this equation says that um, if X is my, uh, you know, density of protein in my cell or something, then if I do not produce more proteins, they'll naturally degrade. You know, they'll do something in my cell and then they'll fall apart, die. So that's described by this term. There is some degradation rate or you know, dying rate for proteins in my cell. This is my density of proteins in the cell. But if there is an RNA, it'll kick in and produce proteins. So this first term says, you know, rate of change of protein is birth and death of proteins. And the birth is controlled by uh, Birth is controlled by how many RNA there are, and death is controlled by how many they die. Then uh, <clears throat> there is some experimental uh, biochemistry that says RNA it's also would die on its own, but if I have a two of these proteins, it'll stimulate uh, generation of RNA. So this term says, uh, if I have some proteins, they'll quadratically, you know, pairwise, they will stimulate the production. This says, that is the death. And this term says that, you know, if I have too many proteins, this saturates, you know, I cannot have arbitrarily high rates of production of RNA. So that's what these terms look like. And we are told that A and B are positive numbers. That's obvious uh, because you know, things can spontaneously only die, not be born. So the usual strategy for in two dimensions for this kind of systems, to get some idea about them, you know, you draw the null clines. So the first null cline is if I don't want to have any velocity horizontally, I just look at 
lost vertically, then x has to be y over a, uh, or y is ax, obviously. So just a straight line, that one is totally trivial, the first null right. line, it's a linear equation. And uh, the second null line, when I only want to have horizontal velocity, nothing vertical, is if I said this equal to zero, you know, y is just one over b, what's on this side. And this equation has a property that when x is small, it starts as a quadratic term is a coefficient, the curvature coefficient controlled by B. So it starts as a parabola, but then the denominator kicks in. So I know that when X is large, this is just one over B, right? Because this guy's, uh, the ratio comes closer to the one. So generically what I expect is uh, that I go up and down and now whether I have a fixed point or not is extremely simple because I have this uh, generation, you know, decay rate of A and uh, I can make it faster and slower. For example, I can heat my proteins or cool them down or something, you know, or use some chemical intervention, which will change the slope of this line, right? So if the slope is sufficiently large, there'll be only one fixed point. That one is always there. And uh, after some critical value, I'll always have three fixed points. So now, you know, you compute these fixed points, and they are obtained, of course, fixed points are obtained when both velocities are zero. So you have to solve these two equations together. This is gonna be quite easy because y is in a very simple place. So, you know, you find out from here, ax is just this part divided by b by eliminating y. Uh, X is cancel, and you get a uh, quadratic equation. <laughs> so even though this looks very complicated to find the uh, fixed points, you only have to solve quadratic equations. So it's very simple. And you find that, uh, you know, one fixed point is always there. That's when X is zero. And, um, <laughs> that two more fixed points, then, you know, you do the usual thing, you write your stability matrix, which is derivatives of uh, X and Y with respect to X and Y. So for example, if I take derivative of this with respect to X, I get minus A. If I take derivative to Y, I get plus one. You fill it out. Uh, you find that the rate of this is always negative because uh, trace only depends on death rates of these guys. So that means that uh, I will have either attractive points or hyperbolic points. You know, I'll have some contractions. And you work it out, you find out that this is guy this one is unstable. This is stable and this is stable. So your protein machine has two possible states. Uh, and that is of course, you know, in this case, when if, if the proteins die out too fast, so your slope is up here, the system dies. But if it's below the critical value where, you know, tangency to this point, then the system has two possible solutions. If you start it too wimply, so you start a system with too few proteins and too few, you know, proteins this way and RNA this way, you know, there is the separatrix. 
And on this side of the world, the system dies. Your cells will not be able to. But good news, it also has an active uh, fixed point, which is attractive. So if you start with sufficiently many proteins and RNA, the system will stabilize in you know, RNA uh, stimulating protein production here and uh, protein production stimulating RNA generation and you will have a exit exit. So now, you know, that, that's an example of this picture that you might not have believed, but, uh, you know, nominally have, this example has three fixed point, but this one is boring, right? The important stuff happens here. And, uh, you know, this picture here is what's happening here. As you move your production, you know, you go through tangency or flow death and stuff like that. And going back to what we learned about bifurcation in uh, chapter three of Strogat's book, uh, we cheat in the same way. We just make a list from one dimension and then we stick in the second dimension by, uh, you know, making my two-dimensional flow go to the one-dimensional image, right? So then, you know, the list is most generic thing is saddle node. You know, either nothing happens or a stable, unstable fixed point is there and they have that typical flow, we just run through it. Or I have a symmetry which forces, you know, everybody here being proportional to the X, that's transcritical or pitchfork. That will be a situation where either I have only one fixed point or I have three. And then depending, you know, on how the signs work out left and right, I will have a either super, supercritical, supercritical, which means as I increase my parameters, I get my stable point will turn unstable and there'll be a pair of stable guys. That's a typical picture. But if the sign is wrong, as I increase my parameter, I see nothing. Uh, I hear, you know, I just see a unstable a stable point in the sky. And then it uh, goes unstable, but what's really happening is that uh, out there, if I perturb my system sufficiently, I would find the other guys. It's called subcritical. You know, I haven't been to kindergarten in two years, so I might have lost my skills. Sorry. Super critical. <laughs> I hate these names. And the signs. Uh, Minus, and this is third power. But the reason why all powers are odd is the system is assumed to have no distinction between left and right. So if I write my equation, they should be same if x goes to minus x, so that's satisfied. And uh, you know, there's a parameter. And then we cheat, we just say, I dot is minus one. That means there'll be like three things, mu negative, mu zero, mu positive. But there's always fixed point at origin. When mu is negative, and this is negative and this is negative. So that means the X is flowing into this point, you know, from the left hand side, it goes this way. And if X is negative, it goes that way. So all the flow in Y direction, everything always falls like a ton of rocks and it's all falling in here. So this is an attractive fixed point. When I get to a small X, 
I do have this minus sign, so I'm attractive. But I'm moving not linearly with x. You know, that will give me exponential motion like here. But I'm moving very slowly because x to the cube is much slower than x, right? So what happens is uh, everybody falls down like ton of rocks. Approach this axis and they discover, oh, man, I got to go really slow. So they get, because this is very fast, exponentially fast, and this is only parallel, they get close to the axis and they all bunch up. And uh, if you run this in computer, you'll find it very painful. That's called critical slowdown. Everybody's, so this is attractive, but, you know, kind of weirdly, very uh, slowly attracting. When U is positive, you know, this is unstable. So you flow away. What has happened is that uh, mu minus x squared is deciding where these two guys are. So that's the quadratic equation we just solved already for the uh, subtle point case. There's a pair of these guys which had you know, square root of mu. This is repelling. This is attractive. So, you know, it's the same story that we did in uh, one dimension.